Greetings to everyone present here today. I am Tolisa Koso from the Pyrometallurgy Division of Mintech in South Africa. I'm locked in from Johannesburg where the weather is fairly warm at about 22 degrees Celsius. Uh, perhaps let me start by welcoming everyone from all over the world to this special webinar organized by the Southern African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy on primary and secondary production of aluminium melts. The aluminium industry is strategic uh, in many countries, including in South Africa. According to the recently developed South African Aluminium Industry Roadmap, South Africa would like to double employment in its aluminium industry and also double the volume of aluminium products produced in South Africa. Today's topic is therefore very relevant to the international community and in South Africa to be specific. With that said, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today. That is Dr. Uh, Metol Gokelma. Dr. Metol Kokelma completed his Bachelor's of Science Studies at Dokus Eilul University in Turkey, as well as Master's of Science in Metallurgical Engineering and PhD at RWTH Aachen University in Germany. He has worked in several roles in his career, including being a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He's currently working as the head of Metallurgy Lab at the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at ISMO Institute of Technology in Turkey. Dr. Kokelma is a published author in different international journals and conferences. He has been involved in organizing and chairing of sessions in several international conferences. He is actively involved in human capital development through primary and co supervision of MSc and PhD studies. Enrolled in, um, enrolled in many international universities. Dr. Kokelma, Dr. Kokelma is, uh, is a co-supervisor of many students uh, enrolled for PhDs and MSCs. He also gave lectures on refining and recycling of melts at Norwegian University of Science and Technology and Metallurgy and Properties of Molten Aluminium at RW2H University. Dr. Kakalma is a member of international committees, including Recycling and Environmental Technologies Committee and Aluminium Committee of TMS. I'd like to hand over to Dr. Kakalma to proceed with his webinar titled Primary and Secondary Production of Aluminium Melts. Perhaps before uh, he starts, may I kindly remind the audience to post their questions in the Q&A tab. Please do not use the, ch uh, the chat tab because we might miss your important questions. Over to you, Dr. Kokelma. Dr. Gosa, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I will try to uh, share my screen now. <clears throat> Can you see the full screen? Yes, we can see it, Dr. Kovlema. Thank you very much. Uh, as, as Dr. Gosso already introduced, I will talk about uh, production of aluminium in primary routes and secondary routes. I will um, mostly focus on the methods, how we do it in primary and secondary, and uh, what are the alternatives and what are the challenges in, this, in these topics. So just, uh, I have just one slide for introduction of aluminium since um, all of you already know how important it is. It is the th uh, third abundant element in the earth crust and second most abundant metal after, uh, after silicon. And it is uh, light metal. Uh, we we um, define light metals uh, with density below approximately 4.5 gram centimeter cubic. Uh, so, uh, aluminium from known metals, silver uh, known metals, aluminium, magnesium, and titanium are light metals, and aluminium is one of them, uh, three times lighter than the steel. And it has low melting points. Uh, it changes, of course, the costs uh, of processing uh, in comparison with iron and steel industry. It has a good corrosion resistance uh, because aluminium oxide is a stable, very stable oxide. 
<clears throat> and uh, we can deform it, we can form it. Uh, that is why we use it in, uh, as foils in, in everyday life. And it is recyclable. Although uh, the oxide of aluminium is not uh, easy to reduce, uh, because it is stable, the oxide percentage in a scrap uh, is very low. Uh, is usually uh, below uh, 1%. And this is not the case for iron. As you would know, you can even see the oxide with naked eye and it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, so you can even completely uh, lose uh, iron because of oxidation and the same for magnesium, for example. Uh, but for aluminum, although we cannot recover the oxide, uh, the, the metal is somehow protected by that. I will uh, start first uh, very shortly about Bayer process plus Hall Herald process, which is uh, very well known and uh, used by many industries. Uh, a big picture is to produce one kilogram of aluminium. For every one kilogram, I use four kilograms of primary sources, natural, our natural sources, the bauxite, and approximately 400 grams or approximately 0.4 kilogram of carbon and a lot of electricity because it is produced by molten salt electrolysis. And uh, for every one kilogram aluminium, we produce two kilograms of red mud. Uh, I, I wrote it with question mark, uh, the terminology waste, because if we use, use something uh, within the production, we call it byproduct. But if it, is, if it is not used, then we call it waste. Red mud uh, is currently, unfortunately, a waste. Uh, and there are many projects going on, including us, uh, but there is no industrial scale of uh, valorization of red mud. That's why we can call it waste. So uh, for one kilogram of aluminum we produce, we produce double waste and consume electricity, consume carbon, and our natural sources. And uh, in, in bio process, as you see here, this red mud is a, uh, is a muddy face. This is the reason of a hydrometallurgical processing in bio process. By leaching, dissolving of oxides and precipitating, we produce aluminum oxide. So this is a hydrometallurgical process. That's why the, the waste of it is kind of liquid mud face. And after this, when we receive aluminum oxide from Bayer process, then uh, we go for molten salt electrolysis. The method uh, in whole earth process of to produce aluminum is molten salt electrolysis. And the, in electrolysis, as you would know, uh, there must be a cathode, anode, and electrolyte. Electrolyte in this case is molten perlite. It's a salt mixture. And uh, it should be molten to be to be the electrolyte, uh, and this needs a lot of energy. That's why. And we have carbon as anodes, and as cathode is the surface of uh, liquid aluminium. In this case, here uh, briefly, here we have the carbon uh, anodes. I will uh, show presenter laser. Um, we see here the carbon anodes and the point feeder. We have here the crust of the uh, electrolyte because of the radiation. Here we have solidification, but this is also an uh, advantage sometimes because it reduces the radiation and the heat losses. And to avoid heat losses, we have a silicon carbide bricks, carbon linings, brick lining, and, and the steel shell. And in the electrolyte, uh, the, the, the purpose of the electrolyte is passing the electric current from anode to the cathode. And we use this electrolyte because it has an ionic conductivity. That's why salt is used. In, uh, there are also some other electrolysis in other metal production or refining. Uh, we use electrolysis for copper to refine the copper. Silver, gold, it is used 
but this is refining electrolysis. Uh, and this is called uh, winning electrolysis. This is the difference between them. And for copper, silver, and gold, the electrolysis is aqueous electrolysis. It's in the water. Uh, but aluminium oxidizes, of course, and we need to get uh, aluminium liquid, so that's why we need the temperature. Uh, so we use the molten salt. And another uh, reason we use uh, this electrolyte is because it dissolves alumina. Uh, it is needed because alumina will not melt in this temperature. The temperature is uh, approximately 1000 degrees, uh, ideally uh, 960, 70 Celsius uh, degrees. Uh, so alumina will not dissolve. The melting point of alumina, sorry, it will not melt. Melting point of alumina is over 2000 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's why alumina has to dissolve. Alumina, in this case, is aluminum oxide. We call it we call alumina. Uh, so it dissolves the feedstock and separates the anode and cathode products. So the anode products is the gas, actually, and the cathode product is the liquid aluminum. Uh, some challenges, important challenges, is that the temperature is relatively high. I call it high because it is 300 degrees above the melting point of aluminium. So actually to, to receive aluminium uh, as a liquid product, we don't need much higher than uh, 660 degrees Celsius. But the production temperature, the processing temperature of the molten salt electrolysis is 960, 70 degrees Celsius. And this, the reason of this is the melting point of the electrolyte. Uh, the solid electrolyte would not pass the electric current. That's why we needed liquid, and that's why we are above, a lot above aluminum uh, melting temperature. So this is one of the uh, challenge I would uh, define and an electrolyte doing the same job as chlorolyte, but having a less a lower melting point would save a lot of energy and money. And the carbon dioxide emission is relatively high due to the consumable anodes. In most of the electrolysis, if you are familiar in acute electrolysis, anode is almost never consumable. But here we use a consumable anode. Uh, there is no advantage of, uh, according to the production, that the anodes are consumed. But uh, carbon is a cheap material. That's why it is used. And it likes to oxidize and oxygen is everywhere. That's why it is consumed. It is not consumed because of the uh, production process, just because of the air. And that means a lot of carbon dioxide emissions, although we don't use carbon in uh, the reduction of aluminium. And the energy consumption is quite high uh, because we need a lot of electric electricity uh, in, this, in this process. A big aluminium company uh, consumes um, electricity as much as a big city. So the overall reaction is aluminum oxide plus carbon and the product is aluminum liquid and carbon dioxide gas. But this doesn't mean that this is a carbothermic reduction, although the overall reaction looks like a carbothermic reaction, it is not. Uh, so the alternatives here could be inert anodes. Uh, there are uh, a lot of works on it, or there have been, and there are also some groups working on this. Um, and this could save a lot of carbon dioxide emissions uh, and reduce the environmental concerns in aluminium primary production. But because it is not really cheaper, uh, it didn't real realize in the, in the industry. So the candidates for inert anodes can be ceramics, can be metals, and can be ceramics. This is a composite the materials from ceramic and metal. Uh, so these are the challenges and alternatives in that, uh, in that case. And another interesting 
alternative would be, or if it is an alternative, is the carbothermic reduction process. And I will tell very shortly how is it possible to do, and if it is possible, uh, because we know in metallurgy, uh, we use almost in every matter of carbothermic reduction process. This is a very well known process and cheap again because carbon is cheap. Uh, here we see the Ellingham diagram. Uh, most of you are familiar with this. And here is the aluminum oxide stability line, and it meets with carbon temperatures above 2100 degrees Celsius, almost 2500 Kelvin above this. This is a very high temperature uh, because we need alumina uh, liquid here. So the challenges with the carbothermic reduction process for in the case of aluminum is it needs very high temperature. And this means a lot of cost. And it is not only cost because we know aluminum. Again, if you look at aluminum diagram, uh, aluminum oxide line is uh, very low. It has very uh, low minus uh, delta G. This means aluminum oxide is very stable. So it oxidizes, aluminum oxidizes uh, when it finds any, ch any chance. If you try to process a metal above 2100 degrees Celsius, the oxygen affinity of aluminum is also becoming a very big problem. So if you want to do it, it has to be uh, under a protective atmosphere. And protective atmosphere for aluminum is not very easy. It is not just blowing argon uh, because aluminum can oxidize even, even with PPM range of oxy oxygen in the atmosphere. But this is a big challenge. And the third challenge is formation of aluminum carbides. Carbon has uh, solubility in aluminum. This solubility in uh, aluminum processing uh, temperatures in the melt treatments around 700 degrees, it is not much. Uh, then we can talk about easily PPMs, easily below 40, 30 PPM of carbon is this often aluminum. But it, it, you can see it here. And it uh, significantly increases with temperature, the solubility. And when it comes to the production temperatures of carbothermic process, in case we want to do it, it easily reaches 10 weight percent and 20 atomic percent of carbon, this salt in aluminum. But uh, when we have the solid aluminum product and it cools down, it means the solubility will decrease, so aluminum carbide will precipitate. And with 10 weight percent carbon, uh, for every three carbon, you see here item, you need four aluminum. And as far as I remember, approximately 1.5 times there will be more aluminum carbide at the end in the product. So that means something between 10 and 15 percent aluminum carbide you will produce in aluminum production. If nothing oxidizes, the yield will be 75 percent. If there is also some oxidation, it can uh, dramatically uh, reduce the efficiency. And the fourth challenge is evaporation of aluminum, because uh, for good reduction, we need temperatures close to 2,500 degrees and a bit above 2,500 degrees, aluminum already evaporates, uh, sorry, uh, already boils. So there will be also a lot of evaporation of aluminum and this increases also oxidation. Um, there have been a project called NXL uh, and they used the method uh, vacuum carbothermic reduction and the energy reduction was stated 20% and greenhouse gas emission reduction was 50%. But the method is under vacuum. That is, this is an important thing. Uh, if, it, if you want to upscale it in industrial scale, and you can imagine how many million tons aluminum do we produce, a vacuum process uh, for a second most abundant metal in the earth crust uh, is not very easy to realize. And the third uh, I want to mention is the Peterson process. 
Peterson process is a candidate uh, to um, uh, alter the bio process, to replace bio process. And uh, this is as old as bio process, as far as I know, but it, it has not used, it has not been used. The Peterson process, uh, instead of bio process, says bio process first uh, um, produces alumina via hydrometallurgical method and then goes for pyrometallurgy, molten salt electrolysis. Peterson process is doing first pyrometallurgy, first reduces bauxite as it is with uh, carbon, carbon thermal reduction, and produces iron. Iron and some other base metals, which, which is um, reduced with iron, like silicon, like manganese, cobalt. Uh, and then we have an iron alloy. Then we have a slag. This is calcium aluminate slag. And go for hydrometallurgical process, leaching, with like, like bio process actually. And then uh, the product is aluminum oxide to be processed in molten salt electrolysis again. So the pyro hydro pyro is the root, and in bio process, it is hydro pyro. So because one process is less, if you do bio plus molten salt electrolysis, the cost is less. But we produce insane amount of waste because all this iron fraction goes for goes to red mud and it's not produced. So this is the advantage of Peterson process. There is no red mud generation and it's called gray mud. Uh, the color red in red mud is because of iron oxide. And in this case, because we reduce iron oxide easily with carbon, uh, the, the color of the mud is not red anymore. So we call it gray mud. And it is 80% mostly calcium carbonate mud. Uh, and another advantage is we have two products. One is iron alloy, and another one is aluminum oxide, instead of one product, which is aluminum oxide. The challenges of Peterson process is uh, we need high temperature for reduction, so we need an extra step, which is pyrometallurgical step. It increases the cost, of course. Um, and in my opinion, the biggest challenge in Peterson process is achieving a leachable slag. Because when you produce here iron and the slag, and this slag has to go for hydrometallurgical process because our target is alumina. This is our first target, not iron. And in the leaching, uh, in hydrometallurgy, uh, the phases must be leachable. And this leachability changes a lot with the uh, primary uh, ore source. What you add in the electric furnace changes the composition and phases in the slag, and this directly changes the leachability. Uh, and it is not very easy to control the, the ore con uh, concentration, and this can be an issue and challenge in that way. Uh, and another challenge is the fluxing. Uh, you cannot easily reduce the bauxite just as it is, because then you need higher temperatures. To lower the temperature, we uh, use additive, which is lime, and lime is not very cheap, so it increases the cost too. To summarize the primary production part, uh, the Peterson process versus Bayer process. Iron oxide concentration in the raw material is a very important factor as a challenge because it will change the, uh, change the uh, feasibility. So if the ore has not very high iron oxide concentration, then suddenly that re first reduction, pyrometallurgical reduction can be unfeasible. And this is the biggest challenge. And the second biggest challenge is achieving a leachable slag to produce uh, the alumina we uh, target. And the second is the bio process plus modern salt electrolysis. The challenge is the environmental concerns, 
not concerns, sorry, uh, the concerns to the, due to the red mat generation. And uh, red mat should become a byproduct instead of being a waste to, to make this process more feasible, environmental friendly. And uh, a challenge is also high carbon dioxide emissions uh, due to consumable anodes and due to how you produce electricity can be also can also increase the carbon dioxide emissions. Alternative skill could be inert anodes instead of consumable anodes and renewable energies uh, to produce electric. Um, another challenge is the high melting point of electrolytes. Uh, which is 300 degrees Celsius uh, above the melting point of aluminium and alternative electrolyte compositions with lower melting point would be a good option. And the last one is the carbothermal connection. Uh, the import, three important challenges. Uh, firstly, it is too high processing temperatures. Uh, above 2100 degrees Celsius and ideally above 2300 degrees Celsius. Uh, vacuum atmosphere could be needed for oxygen affinity. That's a challenge too. And a lot of aluminum carbide uh, formation in the level of 10-15% is also a challenge because it lowers the efficiency. So now uh, I will start for the raffination, and this is also uh, the, actually the same process. The raffination melt treatment process is the same for secondary and primary aluminum production. You will see it in the chain here. So it doesn't matter how we produce aluminum, it can be produced in a melting furnace, uh, which is a typical production of secondary aluminum, so recycling, or we can produce via molten electrolysis, so a primary aluminum. And it approximately goes, they approximately go the same maltreatment here in this, in this chain. It goes first to the ladle treatment, such as alloying, and then casting furnace. In casting furnace, there will be some homogenization, skimming of the oxide skin, the dross, and a sedimentation. Afterwards, the degassing process to remove hydrogen and alkalis, grain refining, Filtration and casting. <clears throat> so uh, that's why melt treatment can be uh, used both for primary and secondary melts <clears throat> in case they need that. And mostly uh, aluminum is uh, always alloyed and hydrogen dissolves in aluminum. That's why mostly you have hydrogen problem. So this degassing and ladder treatment uh, is a must in uh, aluminum melt treatment. So there are three main uh, impurity removal methods. First is sedimentation, second is gas purging, and third is filtration. Sedimentation is done in the casting furnace. The sedimentation is the process where we let the solid uh, impurities to settle down on the bottom of the uh, crucible or uh, the furnace. Uh, so as a method sedimentation, we cannot really call it removal. Um, it is removal because it is not in the product, but uh, actually it is isolation. We isolate the solid impurities uh, on the bottom of the furnace, and it works only for solid impurities. And the second one is the gas purging. We can do it via a noble gas or a reactive gas. Uh, you can see here the degassing and little bubbles. And uh, this is a rotor, degassing rotor, uh, homogenizes uh, the bubble distribution in the melt. And <clears throat> if this is a noble gas, uh, then we can use, we can dissolve some, uh, remove some dissolved impurities to hydrogen. In reactive gas, we can remove alkali metals. Uh, but as a side effect, there will be always removal of uh, solid impurities. Uh, the solid impurities, especially the small ones, will be carried with the bubbles to the surface, such as uh, we do in mineral processing as flotation. 
So the flotation is a side effect of gas purging, the gas in aluminum. In addition, uh, we have filtration, and filtration is uh, like a typical fil uh, filtration method, uh, removing the salt impurities. In addition, of course, removing is important, isolation, removing of any impurities, but avoiding impurity formation is sometimes more clever. Uh, the, the parameters which uh, helps us avoiding impurities is firstly the raw material quality, which is not very easy to control, and uh, the cover gas uh, to decrease the oxidation, um, so avoiding some turbulence and melt processing because, as I already mentioned, aluminum oxide is a stable oxide and it forms a stable protective oxide layer on the melt, but it cannot protect if you have turbulence or disturbance of the melt. <clears throat> so if we avoid turbulence as much as we can, uh, casting people knows it better, uh, that how um, uh, carefully they cast products into, into the molds to avoid any turbulence. And temperature control is important. Sometimes uh, there is overheating in some cases, and this increases uh, oxides. Decoating of coated scraps can avoid impurity formation, and smart selection of scrap types, like dirty scraps in one batch and uh, cleaner scraps in one batch, for example. So sediment in sedimentation, basically uh, we have a gravitational force. Uh, going down and opposite in opposite direction we have buoyant force and drag force. So if this FG is bigger than others, there will be sedimentation. And to make it possible, uh, the inclusion uh, has to be heavier than aluminium. An aluminium liquid is has a 2.3 uh, density. And most of the mathematical calculations we do here uh, is based on Stokes' law, which assumes that everything is perfectly spherical. This is a challenge here. Uh, and melt flow, like steering or uh, natural convection, can easily impact the behavior of the particles and can change the sedimentation dynamics. And free settling is not possible usually, and it, it, it depends on the surface tension, like in aluminum tin films, tin films, Reynolds number, steering, etc. So the sedimentation of particles uh, does um, removal or isolation of single particles and agglomerates. Here you can see approximately the densities. Uh, molten aluminum has 2.3 approximately in the melting point and a bit above this at 700 degrees, which is typical processing temperature of aluminum, 700, 720. And in aluminum production, uh, we avoid going over 740, 50, uh, because the oxidation behavior uh, of aluminum changes after that temperature and is not as stable as it is at 700 degrees. Um, so the carbide has a very similar density, as you see, and but most of the density uh, inclusion densities are above aluminum, so that's why sed sedimentation actually works. This is uh, a casting furnace, uh, LIMCA measurements online, uh, online inclusion detection uh, results. Here on the y-axis we see the inclusion counts uh, times 1000, like 50 means 50,000 particles per one kilogram of aluminum. And first when we add the melt uh, or scrap, or whatever, it can be primary or secondary, uh, sedimentation starts. So if you wait like 30, 40 minutes, the level of inclusions is quite low and is ready to cast. So they are isolated on the bottom of the furnace. And then when the casting starts, it is tiltable furnaces. As you know, we tilt the casting furnace and goes and the melt goes through the lander so uh, that we have a good uh, inclusion concentration, so good melt quality. 
And suddenly, when it is close to the end, the inclusion concentration increases. And this is because all the accumulated, uh, all the accumulated particles uh, on the bottom is mixed again into the melt. So this is where uh, the casting should stop. And we know it uh, because of the online measurements. And the challenges is firstly, the settling is disturbed by the convection uh, because the heating in such big furnaces, a furnace like a room uh, and the convection, that's why they, the heating of the furnace is usually by, by a gas from the melt surface. So the temperature differences is a lot. And it's, that's why it disturbs the settling. And time is limited in the production. Uh, of course, if you can wait as long as you can, the, 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 the result will be better. But in a production, it is not always possible. And particles uh, having a similar density with aluminium, a problem, they never settle. Uh, fine particles, although they have a higher density than aluminium, uh, because they are very small, they can be easily dragged and affected by uh, aluminium melt disturbances or uh, flow flow streams. Uh, and we, we need a online detection control to see if sedimentation works or wherever it doesn't work anymore. Another method is the filtration. In the filtration, uh, the principle is you have a suspension, which is aluminium plus impurities. And uh, there is a, a height of the melt. That's why uh, there is a metallostatic pressure on the filter. So the filter medium and the melt goes through the filter medium and forms a filter cake above the filter medium. Might form, might not. Uh, and at the end, we produce a better quality aluminum. So the filtration uses, is used for a separation of suspended particles, uh, mainly oxide particles and oxide skin. Uh, but also uh, some refractory particles. It is because of the furnaces, it has a lot of refractories, linings, bricks, and they have erosion. Uh, and some impurities from grain refiners like titanium carbides or titanium diborides. The filter requirements is uh, it's difficult uh, to handle aluminium because aluminium attacks uh, oxygen a lot and it can reduce oxides. That's why we have also aluminothermal processes. So the, the filter has to uh, have a resistance, a certain resistance to chemical attacks uh, and it must have a chemical neutrality and it, has, it must have resistance also against physical influences like we uh, define here the metallostatic pressure. And due to this metallostatic pressure, uh, the filter can break. Uh, that's why it must have a certain uh, resistance, a mechanical resistance, and also resistance to clogging. Uh, depends on the pore size or the type and the flow. Uh, there can be clogging, and this is also not wanted. So it, it decreases the efficiency a lot. But one of the most important is the chemical attacks, because aluminium can easily attack uh, to many uh, oxides. And if you use metal, aluminium easily dissolves many, many metals. And uh, we have two uh, different filtration modes. One is the cake filtration, like filtering uh, coffee uh, through a filter paper. You, you form here a cake, a filter cake. And there is deep bed filtration. This is another method or mode that particles are attached in the walls of the pores. So uh, the 
melt is cleaned. Most of the time, we have a combined behavior of particles and the filtration efficiency increases uh, with increasing filter length. So this or height, this array, and increases efficiency increases with increasing particle size, easier to filter. So the small particles is a challenge here and also increases with increasing particle density. Uh, and filtration efficiency increases with decreasing filter pore size, smaller size of pores, uh, filter better and the efficiency is high, but not for a long time, uh, because then you have incredibly high cake formation and clogging. And filtration efficiency also increases with decreasing melt velocity. This is one of the maybe the easier methods that if, if you filter like slower, slowly, uh, the efficiency will increase. But the same argument as the sedimentation, uh, production has a velocity too. It has a speed and we cannot sometimes change the speed and we cannot lower it because uh, having a um, slower filtration means slower grain refining, slower degassing, slower sedimentation uh, and slower melting. And sometimes you cannot keep the metal that long because it also increases oxidation. So the challenges here uh, in infiltration is formation of a filter cake. And sometimes it is wanted to have a bit filter cake, but not much because uh, it decreases the life of filter. So you have to change it because it's close. Uh, and uh, another challenge is filtration of small size particles. Small size particles can easily go through the filter. And then in the melt, when they agglomerate, after filtration, become again big cluster and makes the problem, such as aluminum carbide particles. And um, another challenge is variation in filter filtration efficiency. So the variation in this case, what I mean is, uh, let's think that you do filtration uh, with this filter for uh, six hours. The filtration efficiency will not be same in the first hour as last hour. There will be a variation in filtration efficiency. That is one of the challenges in filtration. And in some works, uh, it is even published that in ceramic foam filters, the filtration efficiency can vary uh, from 25% to 95%. It's a very high uh, range of variation. And dissolved elements are a problem because they are dissolved, they are not solid, we cannot filter them. There have been some uh, methods uh, called reactive filters, having some uh, reactive elements inside, so that some, uh, some dissolved elements in aluminum that we don't want react with the filter itself and is removed. But I, I never heard that it is used industrially. The last refination method is the gas purging. We do it either with inert gas, argon or nitrogen, or use a reactive gas like a clear gas. Uh, so with the inert gas, we dissolve hydrogen, uh, we remove the dissolved hydrogen. With reactive gas, we dissolve alkali metals, such as uh, sodium, and sodium attacks um, uh, chloride, chlorine gas and forms sodium chloride and joins to dross and removed. And as a side effect, uh, we have particle removal, such as flotation and mineral processing. So we have bubbles. Usually we have a rotor here, which homogenizes the bubble distribution. And of course, bubbles are growing while going up with the temperature, with the pressure change and takes the hydrogen from the, from the melt and some particles, hydrogen goes into the gas and the particles uh, joins with dross. The removal efficiency can vary 
uh, via uh, bubble size, gas flow rate, and bubble distribution in the input. <clears throat> so the challenges here is the vortex formation, which will increase oxygen. So while removing the dissolved impurities, you produce, you form uh, solid impurities. Another challenge is handling of reactive gases. It's not very easy to uh, handle chlorine gas. Uh, and another challenge is the nitrate formation if you use nitrogen as an inert gas. Some companies use that because it is cheaper, uh, but then the aluminum nitrate is formed, which is a solid impurity and must be removed. And the last part of my presentation uh, is aluminum recycling. Um, so here, what we see is daily aluminum production in average in thousand tons uh, in last 30 years. So as you see, till uh, the year 2000, the growing of aluminum production was not that much. But after 2000, the rate of increasing uh, changed a lot uh, because first of all aluminium started to be used a lot uh, in the packaging and our habit of using packaging changed so we started using a lot of things just for one use uh, like drink cans or kitchen uh, packaging uh, products in addition, aluminium style was started to be used in automotive a lot, aerospace, and so on. So the increase is really uh, significant. And this increase means we, we consume our primary sources, natural sources, and it is limited. And it also means we produce a lot of scraps. This increase means also increasing in the scraps. And there, recycling comes into the, into the game and says, if you do recycling, you will need uh, five to seven units of energy, maybe five to 10 maximum, but natural sources needs 100 units of energy. So the reason is when we do primary production and we use primary sources and produce, goes for the transport usage, and then it is scrap. Here, the primary uh, flow of chart ends. And when the recycling starts, we use collecting. So we use energy for collecting. We use energy for sorting, energy for recycling. And it goes again uh, as a product. So the energy of this uh, red arrows, total of these red arrows are always smaller than this one black arrow. In addition, the waste we produce in primary is always bigger than the waste we produce in recycling. In recycling, the methodology is uh, usually remelting under a salt flux uh, because of Lot of oxides, and it can be remelting via a vortex, especially for small size scraps so that they don't float and oxidize. And the third is for easier scraps, cleaner scraps, direct remelting. And the challenges here is the low collection rates. We cannot collect enough scrap uh, in the world. That's the, that's a big problem. Low sorting efficiency. So we in metallurgy. Uh, our efficiencies of remelting is over 98, 99%. But if you calculate this with collection rate, which is 10%, 20%, and sorting is not better than 50, 60%, they lower the efficiency of recycling, not the metallurgy. In addition, there are many uh, goods, products, which are recycling unfriendly and very complex, very compact, very mixed, and some issues with the melt cleanliness, change the view, the industrial view 
and they try to avoid using scraps in the production, uh, not to kill the milk uh, perspective. And lastly, the advantages. Uh, it, it saves energy up to 95%. In many literature, it says 95%, but it is better to say up to 95% because mostly metallurgists don't calculate this collecting and sorting uh, as energy. So they calculate only remelting, recycling, metallurgical parts. But this collecting and sorting needs also a lot of energy. Uh, so we save up to 95% of energy and it lowers the environmental impacts. Just uh, remember red mud, remember a lot of electricity we use in primary uh, production. Uh, and it has less waste generation, so it depends on the oxide concentration of the scrap. This is mostly the only waste you produce and there can be also salt in uh, recycling under a salt flux, but salt can be reused by dissolving in water and uh, precipitation to drying the water and it can be reused and it is done in industry. And it's cheaper than the primary production. Uh, this was all I wanted to share with you. I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Kalma, for such an insightful um, presentation. Um, we have time for a few questions. Uh, in fact, uh, some people have uh, struggled to post their questions. I've got one question currently for you. Um, Dr. Kokelma, the Ansarial project for the revival of the Peterson process is an ongoing EU project, while the NXL project, which you referred to, was carried out some years ago as an EU project. Are there any ongoing projects investigating the possibilities in the primary aluminium project, sorry, aluminium production beyond the Ansarial project? Well, I was unmute. I was mute. Uh, the, most of the projects in aluminium, uh, in primary aluminium production, are um, concentrated in the red mud issue. Since uh, maybe 10 years or 15 years, a lot of uh, universities uh, and companies, uh, probably, I think also South African universities and companies, and a lot of in Belgium, uh, Germany, Greece, Turkey, it is uh, all focused on red mud. Uh, but except the, the one I, I mentioned, I don't know any projects working on Peterson. Um, but there, are, there have been still some new projects on red mud utilization. Uh, I think Peterson still couldn't win uh, the economic uh, uh, questions, can still not answer the economic uh, part of the questions. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kokelma, for the uh, response. Uh, I hope it answers uh, the questions, uh, actually the specific question uh, from the side of the person who asked it. And uh, from my side, uh, uh, Dr. Kokelma, uh, you've spoken um, at length about the uh, energy and uh, carbon emission food a high cap on uh, footprint of the um, whole Herald process. Uh, may you please comment about the sustainability of the aluminium industry uh, in countries where there are serious electricity generation challenges? Uh, I, I probably ask this because uh, South Africa is one of those countries. How do you produce electricity in South Africa? where we've got challenges in terms of the reliability of uh, 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 electricity production, as well as the high cost of electricity. So I would like to ask you to comment uh, on the possible sustainability of the aluminum industries in such countries. Yeah, uh, aluminum industry, um, the only part that we can talk about sustainability is how the country produces electricity. Uh, so uh, there are some uh, graphics showing that 
and only uh, sustainable in that terms sustainable countries are countries produces electric via hydroelectric centrals hydro or atom uh, uh, centrals they uh, can talk about more sustainability because it doesn't count as carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the case of electricity but uh, many countries still produces uh, from coal uh, plants and the sustainability in that case is not really uh, fulfilling our requirements and the price of electricity is a problem in many cases uh, because most of, in most of the case, um, the companies are negotiating the electric price with the governments for a year so that they get the same price every day for uh, the whole year. Otherwise, they cannot realize their uh, production, um, uh, production rates and the prices and they cannot compete with other companies and this is how it is done in Germany uh, mostly. Uh, so the, if the electricity is problem uh, that you cannot trust the price in long term uh, and uh, the, then the, there will be a big economic problem in that country and if you don't produce electric via hydrothermic centrals for example or hydroelectric centrals sorry uh, then there will be the sustainability issues in addition the sustainability issue is red uh, it is still not sold in none of the countries and there have been even disasters in some countries that uh, a village was under one meter high red mud river i think uh, it's a good question but electricity you must trust the electricity uh, prices it is i think one third 35 percent approximately uh, the price of all aluminium production is just electric Thanks, uh, Dr. Kokalma, for the uh, insightful uh, response. Uh, there is uh, another question, probably the last one. Um, what are elements or impurities most challenging to remove after recycling? Um, in general, in aluminum, the most challenging impurities are always dissolved uh, metals. Because aluminum, uh, Oxide is very stable and, uh, and aluminum is very reactive to almost anything. Uh, most of the metals have less, less uh, reactivity. Uh, that's why it is not possible to remove many elements such as iron, manganese, lead. In recycling, we talked about low uh, sorting efficiencies and some sorting problems. If you have, by chance, by a scrap, uh, some lead in your aluminium, you will be never able to uh, remove it. And no one wants lead. So the only removal, this is even used as a removal method, is the dilution. So if you want to have 50% of uh, the concentration of the current lead concentration in your melt, you add uh, double uh, primary aluminium melts and dilute it. The same story for iron, same story for silicon, same story for manganese. But if iron, silicon, manganese increases by chance in recycling, then you can use them as other products and other alloys which has iron, silicon, and manganese. But as no one wants lead, yeah, I think the lead is the most challenging impurity in recycling. And in general, challenging impurities are almost all metals which are less reactive than aluminium. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Kokalma. Probably uh, we've, we just have uh, got one minute left. Um, maybe let's take the last question. Uh, it's a follow up on the uh, uh, response you gave uh, regarding the energy. Uh, uh, um, issues around the primary production uh, process of aluminium. Um, you mentioned um, the possibility of using renewable energy for primary aluminium production. 
Beyond hydroelectricity, is there solar technology used or considered for the primary aluminum production or even solar thermal for secondary aluminum production? Yes, yes, uh, there are some countries using that. Uh, I think the most effective is hydro, as far as I know. Uh, and wind power is also used, uh, and solar is also used. But um, I, as far as I know, there are some companies, they have their own uh, wind powers, central centrals, and also uh, some solars, so that they can uh, use at least maybe 10%, 20% of the electric uh, consumption from their sources, from renewable sources, and that increases sustainability a lot. But only very big companies can do it. Uh, if, if it is not very big, then uh, you buy what government sells. And if government sells hydro, then it is sustainable. If not, you have no chance. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Kokalma. And that brings us to the end of the uh, scheduled webinar. Uh, uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to convey our sincere gratitude uh, to you, Dr. Kokelma, uh, for honoring the invite to present on such an important topic uh, 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 today. Uh, we also want to extend um, a message of gratitude to all the attendees uh, uh, of this webinar. Uh, thanks a lot for attending the webinar, and uh, we hope that, um, in fact, uh, the team will uh, send or will make available uh, this webinar to all the attendees. Uh, that uh, will happen probably uh, in the next day or two. Uh, thanks a lot for attending, and that brings us uh, to the to the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice.